Welcome everybody to the review session for lecture number nine by Dan Dolan from Sandia National Labs. Dan, please um, go ahead and take over. Okay, so I uh, assigned a couple of velocimetry exercises on Monday and I've got solutions and we can discuss these exercises or any of the questions that have come up between now and then. Um, so, oh, why don't you, okay. First exercise was very much a plug and chug type of uh, ordeal where you say, suppose you have a, a center PDV operating at 1550 nanometer and you want to measure a projectile moving at a kilometer per second. What's the minimum recording bandwidth you would need to track this motion? Well, in PDV, every fringe of signal is a 775 nanometer displacement. So if you're operating at 1,000 meters per second, 1,000 over 775 uh, gigahertz is your beat frequency, which that means is you need a 1.29 gigahertz bandwidth to just cover that. So you're looking at sort of a 2 gigahertz class digitizer or better. In a visor, if you wanted to measure the same velocity, with uh, 10 fringes, so 10 uh, signal cycles. The question was what sort of etalon delay you need uh, to do that, knowing that Visars generally operate at 500 nanometers. Well, if you, 100 meter per second uh, VPF or velocity per fringe, uh, your etalon delay has got to be the wavelength divided by half, and then you throw in uh, the 100 meter per second goes in the diameter, it works out to about 2.66 nanoseconds. So a reasonable chunk of glass, not uh, inordinate. You do see visors uh, with that low of EPF. A lot of visors you tend to see sort of hundreds of meters per second and do a few kilometers per second. Um, for reference, the most sensitive visor in the world actually exists at Sandia and its VPF I think is 12 meters per second, but it's an enormous air delay system and uh, I don't recommend you build one if you don't really, uh, unless you really, really need it. <clears throat> there was a bonus question with this exercise asking what is the limiting velocity resolution for the above PDB measurement if you assume 10% signal noise, 80 giga samples per second sampling, and a 10 nanosecond fast forward transform? Excuse me for a second. <coughs> um, in the uh, lecture, I'd given this formula. This is the limiting uncertainty uh, where you've got the sample rate is in the denominator. The analysis time scale tau uh, is in here. That's 10 nanoseconds. This ratio, this is the uh, sigma s is the signal, uh, uh, sort of the noise, RMS noise here, and a is the amplitude. So the noise fraction, this ratio is 10%. There's a factor of pi and then half a wavelength to turn wavelength, half a wavelength to turn frequency into velocity. What you come up with these numbers is about 0.28 megahertz, which is 0.21 meters per second is your limiting velocity resolution. So that's the best you could ever do with this equipment and that Fourier transform. Now, uh, a related question is, how does this compare to Visar? So Lynn Barker, many years ago, had argued pretty fairly persuasively that the best you can do in a Visar is about 1% to 2% of a fringe, or that is to say, you know, 1% to 2% of the VPF. Well, the VPF in the previous problem we would have described was 100 meters per second, so 1% or 2% of a fringe is 1% to 2 meters per second. Now, this is not exactly a fair comparison, and I realized that as I was working through it, that, uh, it looks to me, at first glance, you might say, well, that means the PDB is a whole lot better. The, the, the sticking point here is that I put the 10 nanosecond FFT uh, in the analysis. If you were to use a shorter uh, FFT to get more comparable time scales, that is the rise time in your signals, uh, a more fair comparison actually puts the PDB uncertainty about 1.6 meters per second. Now, even this is not totally fair because there are some differences in how rise time work between the two uh, diagnostics. but the point of this exercise just shows that, you know, yes, if you do have very good visor measurement, you can have one or two meters per second. If you do a very good PDV measurement, you have similar, maybe somewhat higher, depending on how you uh, how hard you want to push uh, your analysis. Uh, but the two diagnostics are comparable, at least in this in this range. Are any uh, questions? Oh, I see there's something in the chat here. Uh, let's see. How did I attain this uncertainty? So this uncertainty, uh, as I put it, it was in the original lecture, and I've got it in some of my top my uh, papers. You can derive this uncertainty. It basically has to do with how well can you measure frequency in a sinusoid. So you look at, I take a sine wave, and alter its frequency a little bit, and look and see how that measures how that affects the signal 
and then work backwards and say, okay, well, if I have this much signal uh, noise, how does that affect the velocity? So, um, so this is actually a fairly general, uh, forget that lambda over two, that's, that's the PDB specific part. This holds for any function, uh, any sinusoidal function in the world. It could be, you know, um, sound, it could be oscillations in, in, in astronomical events. In fact, I think this is used I came across in a kind of an obscure journal of people looking at oscillations in certain types of stars that you argue that those are planets transition, transitioning across. And so, so this is just purely that relationship of how well can you measure frequency based on the noise you have, how often you sample the signal, and how over what time scale you calculate uh, frequency. So if that, does that answer the question? Uh, I think this is Yuping. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, I at first thought I'd derive this on my own and like, hey, I discovered something new and come to find out, no, this is actually a very old result. Um, the statisticians might talk about a kramer rao bound. Uh, apparently that's what this is for the frequency. All right, now let's go to the second exercise. This is a more conceptual uh, problem, and I kind of hope this will prompt a little bit of discussion. So you say, suppose you've got a projectile, this is my crude drawing of a projectile, where I put a wedged thing at the top, so it moves from the barrel on the, from the left to the right. And suppose I was sitting at point position A, and I could shine a visor and PEB at the projectile. What velocity would I see? Well, I think it's pretty non-controversial that this, from this location, projectile moving at v, towards me at V, visor and PDB will measure velocity V. Now, what gets tricky is suppose, okay. Now, if you looked at position B, um, it turns out both diagnostics observe zero velocity. And uh, what's tricky about this is that the spot, if you imagine when, I, when the projectile, when I was looking over here, the beam distance was a certain length, and as the projectile slides to the right, the distance from where I'm reflecting to the observer gets smaller and smaller. So you might say, well, okay, if visor is a velocity interferometer, I don't see the velocity, but PDV being a displacement interferometer, I should see that displacement uh, change in the spot distance. Turns out that has absolutely nothing to do with the problem. Uh, the distinction of velocity versus displacement was sort of Lynn Barker's way of describing the interferometer differences but in truth, they they do, they work the same way. Um, they both see no velocity. Now, what's why aren't you? Let's go. Okay, let's consider a related problem, which is something you can actually do um, yourself if you like. Imagine a cam. You know, uh, I did this experiment. We went to AutoZone and bought a camshaft and put it in a lathe and started rotating it around. So this little uh, plus sign here is the center of rotation. And so you put this cam sh uh, shaft in here and you rotate around and you have my PDB probe looking dead center where the, the center of rotation is. As the cam rotates, the distance between the probe and the and, and, and that reflection spot changes. This is kind of a crude illustration of when I'm on the flat, when I'm on the round parts, the beam is stationary, but then when, when the lobe comes by, I get this burst of uh, distance. You can do this. I said you can actually do this experiment with. Uh, I've done it with a, a hand, a cordless hand drill. We put like a, a post in there and wrap it in ret retroflective tape. It turns out it doesn't even matter what the shape of this thing is. The fact that it's it's a camshaft, it could be a shamrock. It does doesn't really matter. If you're looking at the center rotation, you see no velocity, no matter how close or far this beam appears to move back and forth. Now, if you are off center, you do see a uh, Doppler shift. But it's exactly the same Doppler shift you would have for the projected velocity. Um, and again, shape doesn't matter at all. Uh, this is illustrated really well in a paper uh, from Brandon Alone and some guys out in Santa Barbara, where they took a uh, circular piece and then they squared off a few edges and they spun this around and had their probe looking at it. Uh, uh, in this case, and looking instead of looking at this rotation center, they were off off axis or by a distance h. And so when you spin it around, your PDB spectrogram looks something like this. It's exactly flat, even though sometimes you're on the flat, sometimes you're on the round, you get exactly the same velocity 
no matter what. Now, they were also developing a related diagnostic, which is an optical ranging, where you actually send light out and you count, you measure how long it takes to get back. So that is a true time of flight diagnostic. And there you do see these, uh, the, these divots every time you're on the flat. So on the round parts, what's confusing is the round parts here are actually the flat part of the spectrogram. And when you're on the flat part, you get these variations in distance. And so these, so these are fundamentally different measurements. And, and what's the confusion comes about is that in PDB or Visar, any kind of these interferometry velocimeters, the signal you get is proportional to the sum of the cosines of all the phase shifts you get. It is not the cosine of the sum of the phase shifts. And I think intuitively, this is what we try to do and say, well, the path lengths are getting smaller and sh shorter and smaller. And so therefore I should see interference. You're like, well, that's true, but you have to do the averaging of the electric fields and then work it out. And you will turn out, you will, you will get the right answer. But this does not work at all. Um, so those were the problems I, I, I assigned. Are there questions about this or any of the other uh, topics we want to we might discuss for velocimetry? So there's only a few of us uh, in the call. So if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Well, I guess I'll, I'll just make a comment. Um, thank you for that exercise number two. That was very interesting. Um, I, I didn't expect that, but now that I've heard it explained, it makes perfect sense, right? Um, if you just think of each particle as having a certain velocity and that being the thing that, ma that matters for the measurement, it doesn't really matter where that particle is. Yeah, I can tell you these, this, this result caused a tremendous amount of argument in the DOE about, I was about 10, 12 years ago, because there were measurements of something where you had an implosion where the shape could change. And the question was, well, if, if new material is moving into the beam, how does that affect the PDB? And it's, it, the answer is it doesn't. It's only the projection of velocity on the beam. Uh, and, and so that's part of the reason these guys came up with their alternate diagnostic, this ranging. Because there you could say, well, I, it's actually measuring the time, time of flight and converting that to distance. But said PDB does not work that way. Gotcha. Looks like there's another question. What is the data size usually obtained from these tests? Uh, you mean, well, I mean, that depends. Every, everything there depends on time scale. So if I'm doing an experiment at Z, the relevant time window is only a few hundred nanoseconds. Now, we generally might have the digitizer record a million points per channel and most of that gets thrown away um but uh then uh, you know in that case you said you know maybe tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of points um long experiments though you know people who are tracking a projectile down a barrel uh storage starts to become a bit of an issue because if you're sampling even one giga sample per second and you want to do you know, a few milliseconds, well, that's millions and millions of points. So you may have to think carefully about your digitizer. You don't necessarily need high bandwidth, but you need to use very deep memory. Uh, but again, now for, these days, memory is usually not the limiting problem on scopes. I mean, I think a lot of the digitizers you buy now can come up with a billion points per channel standard. So um, thanks for that question. Are there any other questions or is it we could talk about things that maybe didn't make sense on Monday? Um, I guess I have a question which is sort of maybe a little bit more, um, I, you know, hypothetical and sort of uh, forward looking. Um, you know, if, if I were to imagine something that would be, you know, really kind of nice to have, it would be uh, like high speed, uh, you know, uh, high speed recording, high speed, uh, you know, like, let's say like a high speed movie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I imagine that at this point, it's not feasible. Um, but is that 
something that might become feasible over time and, and what would be you know sort of the um barriers and challenges to to doing like that you know full are you mean like like a field like looking at a field of velocity and being able yeah. to track right well i mean this is sort of related to, related to a question on monday someone asked about a, a line pdv much like a line visor and um you know i think in theory a lot of these things are possible a lot of it comes down to memory you know storage like where are you going to put the information so you know, I, I think of PDV is right now as being sort of a, a positionally sparse, but time dense measurement. That is to say, you have lots and lots of record measurements in the time domain. Like an example I just gave 80 billion times a second, you're measuring your voltage. Um, framing cameras, you know, things where you take images of uh, you know, impacts and so forth are very spatially dense. That is, you have, you know, very good, lots of points in usually two directions, but they're sparse in the time dimension so somehow you have to you know in theory as i said in theory you could pack pdb probes in whatever shape you want you could make them a 2d array you can make them an x you know whatever the case may be but you got to put that information somewhere knowing that every point has lots and lots of data associated with it so you know continuing the question that uh, Yu Peng asked her from a moment ago suppose every point has you know a million time uh, samples in it and you know, I want a thousand by a thousand grid of spatial points. Well, that's another million. So that's a trillion data points that you have to store, you know, live, you know, in a very, very short amount of time. So it's like, well, where do you how, how do you how do you store all that? I mean, there's the there's the challenge of putting the array together and, and making all this stuff work and buying lots and lots of things. But uh, how many digitizer channels can you use, or how and how much? But how much information can you store is becoming, I think, a ch the challenge. Okay. So, uh, any other questions? If not, then um, I would once again like to thank Dan and uh, thank all of you for attending. And we look forward to welcoming you back again on uh, Monday for our next lecture. Um, which will be about uh, plasticity behind the shot front. Uh, and I think that a lot of the stuff that we learned today and this week from Dan about uh, the velocity profiles uh, will help us to you know, appreciate better the, uh, the measurements that they give us, that tell us about the plasticity behind the shot front. So thank you again. Have a great weekend. <laughs>